Well, good morning to everyone. I'm Dr. Laura Leitcher and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm here live at Providence St. Vincent in Southern Auditorium and we'll get started with just a few announcements and reminders and then introductions for today's talk. Next week we will be hearing from Dr. Jason Haino who will be giving the talk Personalizing Risk Assessment and Primary Prevention of ASCVD. So please be sure to join us in person uh, next week as well. And Grand Rounds is a joint effort between Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland Medical Center. We're always available on Teams Live, uh, so you can watch us virtually, but often we're here on Tuesdays in the auditorium at St. Vincent, and sometimes on Wednesdays at Providence Portland. You can earn CME credit by being here in the room or watching live online or watching a video of the recording. Uh, of the talk and that recording is available at the invite for Grand Rounds. That invite will also always let you know whether we will or will not be meeting live. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout today's session, so please go ahead and post any comments or any questions that you have and I'll mostly hold those until the end to ask as time permits. And now I'm delighted to introduce not one but two fantastic speakers today. We are joined by Dr. Alan Rankin, He's a practicing hospitalist clinician educator at Providence Portland Medical Center. He did his medical school at University of Tennessee College of Medicine and then residency at OHSU. Dr. Rankin has previously earned both the Providence Portland Resident Teacher of the Year and Providence Portland Hospitalist of the Year. And he's currently involved in multiple QI programs, including the Oregon Region Heart Failure Focus Group and the Chemical Dependency Resource Group. We're also joined by Dr. Ben Pedroja, who is also a practicing hospitalist clinician educator at Providence Portland. He earned his medical degree at SUNY Upstate Medical University and then did residency at Providence Portland. He's involved in several leadership, quality improvement and teaching roles, among them the Interprofessional Unit Collaborative Physician Lead and a member of the Code Blue and Code Stroke Committees. He's also director of the internal medicine residency point of care ultrasound and simulation curricula. We're so delighted to have this dynamic duo here today um, to teach us a lot about hospital medicine. Thanks. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you all for being here and thank you those at home listening in online. Um, OK, so title of our talk today is selected updates in hospital medicine 2024 the year in review. I'll speak for about 25 minutes and then I'll hand things over to my colleague, Dr. Alan Rankin. A few objectives here to review with you guys, hoping to review, interpret, and incorporate recent literature relevant to the practice of hospital medicine, really trying to focus on those studies that are informing our practice or perhaps changing our practice. And we're gonna take a case-based approach here and I'll try to keep things moving as well. We've got quite a bit to cover. All right, so our first case here is a 76 year old female history of diabetes and CKD, chronic anemia presenting with chest pain. So you see your vital signs there, generally unremarkable cardiopulmonary exam, noticing though that troponin up to 1100, you're seeing some lateral T wave changes and some ST segment depressions on EKG. We have a new wall motion abnormality noted on echo, and then that hemoglobin at 9.2, which is about her baseline. All right, question for us, which of the following is the most appropriate transfusion threshold for this patient presenting with an MI? This is perhaps seven to eight grams per deciliter, maybe it's 10 or 12 grams per deciliter, or perhaps we ought to avoid transfusion through the risk of volume overload. I'll let you think about that for a moment. Okay, so the background here, really seven grams or seven to eight grams has really been the standard for most patients admitted to the hospital. Um, this was based on earlier data, many of whom would have, would have kind of declined to accept a patient like this into their study with an MI. And so there's been an ongoing controversy that perhaps we ought to have a slightly higher transfusion threshold for these folks. The idea being that if you can improve the carrying capacity and the throes of a coronary event, that perhaps you can improve outcomes that way. But really, this hasn't been borne out by the literature. There's been several small randomized controlled trials, many of whom had conflicting results. And so we don't really have good guidance in this area. And actually we had a reality trial. This was in 2021, uh, 668 patients admitted to VA ICUs, randomized to a liberal versus a transfusion, excuse me, a, a liberal versus a restrictive transfusion 
protocol, and they actually had a slightly higher rate of adverse events here with the liberal group plotted in yellow. And so this seemed to lend further support to this idea that we ought to be sticking with this more restrictive protocol as we do more broadly in the hospital. But we actually have some new evidence in this area that I want to share with you. We had the Mint trial published last year. This is in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Restrictive or Liberal Transfusion Strategy in MI and Anemia. So this was an open label randomized control trial. This was 3,500 patients, by far the large, largest study in this area, admitted to 44 sites in six countries, including the US. And the admission criterion was an acute MI with a hemoglobin of 10 or less. Notably, 55%, over 50% of the folks had type two events, and you couldn't have a STEMI to make it into this trial. So the interventions here was to randomize to a restrictive strategy, transfusing at seven to eight grams per deciliter versus a more liberal strategy at 10 grams per deciliter. And what they did here was they would basically transfuse you upon, immediately upon randomization and then continuing tr to transfuse throughout the hospital course to maintain your hemoglobin above 10. <clears throat> and the primary outcome they were looking at was a composite outcome of MI or death within 30 days. So here's a plot of the average hemoglobin concentration over time up to three days where the yellow group or the yellow line here is the liberal strategy. You can see their hemoglobin jumps up to 10 and then stays there. And they delivered a lot of product for this for this study, triple the number of transfusions um, and up versus the more restrictive protocol. And looking at their outcomes, they did see a slight trend towards benefit with the liberal transfusion strategy. So plotted here is the cumulative instance of the primary outcome, again, which was recurrent MI or death up to 30 days. The yellow is here, the liberal strategy. You can see slightly lower point estimate of these outcomes down to 14.7% from 16.9% did not achieve statistical significance, so just barely. I, importantly though, there was no signal for harm. There's always concern for overload in this population, which was pretty well equivalent between the groups. Now, the real story with this trial was down into the subgroup. So this is a subgroup listed here on the left. This is their tree where to the left of the line favors the restrictive strategy to the right, favors the more liberal strategy. And to call your attention to this group, these are folks with type 1 MIs, where the relative risk reduction in this group was 24% with a number needed to treat of 23. And if you compare that to folks with type 2 MIs, where there was really no benefit seen at all. So, and bottom line here is that the liberal transfusion strategy did seem to yield slightly lower point estimates of recurrent MI and death at 30 days. This was not significant, however, and virtually all of this benefit was seen among patients with type 1 MIs. Now, no signal for harm either. Now, <clears throat> the limitations, this was open label. It's hard to conceal your patient getting triple the number of transfusions over a, trans over a hospitalization, and we're talking about a very small effect size. But I think the most important caveat with the interpretation of this study really has to do with the power of this study to actually detect a difference within this subgroup, right? And in my mind, that's key to the interpretation here. Are we willing to change practice based on a subgroup analysis of type one events? And in my mind, I think it's compelling. We saw 3,500 patients, we had a good mix of folks, more than half of whom had type two events. And so really in my mind, I think we ought to be considering a change here putting our threshold up to 10 grams per deciliter in folks with a type 1 MI. Okay, moving on. Case number two. We have a 79-year-old man with diabetes, CAD, presenting with shortness of breath and cough. He noticed a fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, barely hanging on to his blood pressure and sat at 80% on room air. He looks ill and he's got some increased work of breathing, diminished breath sounds on the left. Otherwise, we're seeing a normal exam. Workup's notable for a high white count, elevated leukocytosis and procalcitonin, you're noticing a left lower opacity on chest x-ray, COVID and flu are negative. So hospital course, uh, diagnosed with community acquired pneumonia, which we can call CAP here, to stabilize with antibiotics and fluids in the emergency department and then triage to the floor on six liters of oxygen. Now, perhaps unexpectedly, now seeing worsening hypoxia, oxygen requirements now jumping up to 20 liters, requiring high flow nasal cannula to maintain saturations and the hospitalist is now paged to the bedside. Okay, so question for us, which of the following steroid strategies will best out, best optimize this patient's outcome? Is that A, avoid steroids as they're contraindicated in pneumonia. Reserve steroids for patients with cap and refractory shock. This is largely what the guidelines would tell us we ought to do. Or do we have reserve steroids for patients with cap requiring mechanical ventilation, or perhaps we ought to consider steroids now. Again, we have a severely ill patient with community-acquired pneumonia. 
OK, background for steroids and pneumonia. You I'm sure are all aware this has been debated for years and years, and there's really been a lot of work in this area over time. And in fact, we had a 2017 Cochrane review, which did seem to show a decreased mortality, decreased need for intubation, mechanical ventilation, and lower lengths of stay in folks who were treated with steroids with severe cap. And this was including 17 trials with over 2,000 patients. The trouble here is the quality of the evidence was considered to be moderate at best, and this treatment was really not recommended in guidelines either by the Thoracic Society's or the Infectious Disease Society of America. So it really has not come into the standard care for patients with severe pneumonia. And in fact, we had a study in 2022, um, one of the two recent big studies in this area, the ESCAPE study, which showed among 586 patients that there really was not a mortality benefit here. And these were critically ill patients admitted to 41 VA ICUs, randomized to get methylpred versus placebo and followed for 60 days. <clears throat> now, the new trial I want to tell you about is the Cape Cod trial, which was published um, in May 2023 in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can see the title there, hydrocortisone and severe community acquired pneumonia. And this trial is really asking us to revisit this question of steroids and pneumonia. So this was a multi-center, double-blind RCT. The population was 800 critically ill patients admitted to 31 centers in France, all between 2015 and 2020. This was a sick population. Almost a quarter were intubated. Another 40% were on high flow nasal cannula. Notably, you could not have septic shock, flu, or unbe unwilling to be intubated to be into the study. And notably, this was halted after a planned interim analysis in 2020 in March. You may recall, it would have been a difficult time to continue a study like this. Okay. <clears throat> And now the interventions here, they actually randomized folks to receive IV hydrocortisone given as a continuous infusion, 200 milligrams per day versus placebo. And then day four, they would make a decision as to whether to complete eight or 14 days of steroids based on physician judgment of clinical response. Um, outcomes here, all-cause mortality at 28 days, then a couple secondary outcomes, which is all-cause mortality at 90 days, ICU length of stay, and then progression towards need of mechanical ventilation. They had a couple safety outcomes that were listed there as well. So plotted here is the risk of death here. The placebo in green, the hydrocortisone in this yellow orange color, and you can see re risk reduction at 5.6%, which put the number needed to treat at 17.5. And this effect was durable, durable down to eight to 90 days. And importantly, there was a lower risk of intubation, intubation. So if you look at the subgroup of patients who were not intubated at the start of the trial, that's 442 patients, the hazard ratio was way down to 0.59 for receiving mechanical ventilation during the study period. And there was no difference in bleeding, other uh, adverse outcomes, aside from a slightly higher average rate of insulin, which you may expect in a patient like this. So bottom line here, I think we're seeing accumulating, accumulating evidence that steroids are beneficial for severely ill patients with CAP. And based on the um, decreased need of intubation in this trial, I think it's very reasonable to at least consider steroids in severely ill patients with pneumonia requiring lots of oxygen, like our patient in the question stem, who is on 20 liters of high flow rates of pain. Uh, I think this is perhaps a surrogate outcome, but I think it's reasonable to expect we may extract some real benefit if we're able to prevent intubations. Now, some caveats. This was stopped early, right? They were aiming to recruit about double the number of these patients, and they also excluded non-severe community acquired pneumonia. And their mortality overall was about half of what they expected, about 20 to 25 percent of what was expected. And for some reason, they seem to have recruited a slightly less, less sick patient population. Not quite sure how that plays, but important to note that. So returning to our question stem, I think it's very reasonable in this severely ill patient with community acquired pneumonia to at least consider steroids, both for all-cause mortality benefits and the reduced need for intubation that we see in this study. OK, moving right along. <clears throat> we have a case number three. This is a 48-year-old male with hypertension, alcohol use disorder, presenting with one day of epigastric pain, nausea, and vomiting. You can see the vital signs there, slightly tachycardic, otherwise doing okay. He has some epigastric tenderness on exam. Workup notable for a very high lipase. We see an LFT changes in the pattern consistent with uh, alcohol use. We had a blood alcohol level of 45 and some peripancreatic stranding seen on CT. So question for us, which of the following was uh, fluid resuscitation strategies would you choose to prevent disease progression? So is this A, normal saline at 250 mils an hour? Is this B, lactated ringers at 250 hours plus a bolus? 
or maybe we ought to do slightly lower rates without the bolus, only as needed. Uh, and just for your recollection from last year, we had the waterfall trial, which would really point us towards a more moderate resuscitation strategy, right? So it's really just between normal saline and lactated ringers as the best actor choices. Okay, now in the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip ahead to the punch light. I'm sorry to do this to you guys. Um, we had the apprentice study, which I want to tell you about. And this was a large um, cohort study where they had a thousand patients. It was kind of looking at different treatment groups, whether you received LR in the first 24 hours, whether you received NS in the first 24 hours, or if you received both, and looking at the rate of progression to severe pancreatitis. And we saw a pretty massive reduction, 48% reduction in patients who received LR during that first hospital day. And this seemed to be consistent across subgroups. They looked at the etiology of the pancreatitis, didn't seem to be a difference, pretty robust effect there. And they also did some exclusions based on the waterfall criterion. They excluded those patients who received what would be considered an aggressive resuscitation strategy, and still they saw this benefit. So it does seem to be a durable effect um, here with acute pancreatitis. Now, the limitations, of course, this is observational, right? It's a good size trial, a thousand, but it's observational. And importantly, we don't know what the physicians were using in terms of their treatment goals, right? The waterfall trial and others have shown us that we really ought to be targeting particular clinical indicators as to drive our fluid strategies, whether that's hypotension or other signs of hypovolemia. And we have no idea, no clue really as to what factors may have been used in this study to guide our treatments. But nonetheless, there was seem to be a durable association with LR in that first 24 hours in terms of the progression of severe to severe disease. All right, so we'll turn to our question stem. I think for very uh, clear reasons, um, consistent with a lot of what we probably already believed, this patient with acute pancreatitis would probably do well with LR. All right, continuing with this same case, we have the same patient here, the 48 year old with alcohol use disorder and acute pancreatitis. Noticing that tachycardia seemed to be improved with LR and the ED there, pain controlled with some IV dilated, and we're seeing some blood pressure stabilizing. <clears throat> now the hospitalist is paged now due to agitation and diaphoresis, still boarding in the ED as usual, and we're asked to kind of come in and see what might be going on here. So I think it's no surprise here. This is consideration at least for alcohol withdrawal. And so you get a little more alcohol use history. Uh, noting that he drinks a fifth of day of alcohol more in recent days. Um, he does have a history of severe withdrawal requiring ICU admission. Um, he does report efforts to cut down and desire to achieve remission. So question for us, which of the following is the most appropriate agent to control withdrawal? Is this A, chlordiazepoxide, B, diazepam, C, lorazepam, D, phenobarbital, or E? Perhaps all of the above would be appropriate. Okay, so phenobarbital for alcohol withdrawal. So I really do think we're seeing a practice change underfoot, but not because there's new amazing data that I'm here to show you, right? Um, but I want to talk about the state of affairs here with phenobarbital and talk about um, how we ought to be using this information. Because I, for one, I really think this is a good option for hospitalized patients. I'd like to share you some of these details here. So as you probably know, symptom-triggered benzodiazepines have been first generation, or sorry, first line for a generation or more. And this is really based on pretty limited data. Um, there's been this perceived higher risk of profile with phenobarbital. And a lot of this came, again, from early trials, observational trials. And then we had a statement, a 1996 statement from the American Society of Addiction Medicine saying that because of the synergistic activity of phenobarbital and alcohol, that there was seen to be higher risk or perceived at least higher risk for sedation, higher risk for respiratory compromise when you use phenobarbital. And so for that reason, we've been using benzodiazepines as first, first line for decades, really. But we're seeing observational studies, lots of them, that seem to show a, a benefit with phenobarbital over, over benzos. And some of them here are listed here, reduced ICU admission, reduced length of stay, reduced need for mechanical ventilation, and decreased benzodiazepine requirements overall. <clears throat> so what are the actual evidence we have? The best is probably this 2013 randomized control trial, small study, 102 patients. Um, well, these were ED folks, randomized to either receive symptom-triggered lorazepam plus a loading dose of phenobarbital or symptom-triggered lorazepam alone. And they saw some pretty good benefits here. Reduced ICU admission down to 8% from 25% for folks receiving benzos. The need for lorazepam infusion was reduced, again, down to 4% from 31% with benzos. The total lorazepam needs were reduced, although they did not see any changes in length of stay, 
or any changes in the rate of adverse events. And there was, a, there was an earlier trial in 2011, even smaller than this one that had pretty similar findings. And if you took a systematic review, which was published in 2013, sorry, 2023, had those two trials plus an additional five cohorts, there didn't seem to be any changes in ICU admission. Again, this is five studies um, <clears throat> combining most, seven studies, mostly cohort studies, did not see a benefit there. But importantly, if you pulled up all the adverse outcomes, these were things like respiratory depression, hypotension, seizure, um, all of the pooled adverse effects did not seem to be different between the groups, right? Here's their forest plot, where to the left would benefit phenobarb, to the right would benefit placebo, and there's just no change seen there. And in 2022, we actually had, uh, excuse me, a plea for new research published in the annals, right? Inpatient notes, managing alcohol withdrawal syndrome in the hospital center, so a, a call for research, because it's really kind of desperate for new guidance in this area. And I just want to touch on the pharmacology this is really the story with phenobarbital. This is the reason it's coming to our attention now, is it just has favorable pharmacology for folks in the hospital. It has a very harm, long half-life. We're talking days and days. And then you get an auto taper over days as well, which can, provides continued benefit even after the hospitalization. And you can see you can get very high therapeutic levels. This is graphing CSF level over time, with a red line there is a theoretical therapeutic level. You can give a big loading dose all at once, get above that level, then it'll stay there. And if you give additional doses beyond this, it'll just step up to a high level and it'll stay at that higher level again for days and days. It has a very predictable and linear dose relationship. If you give 10 megs per keg, you can be pretty confident you're going to get between 10 and 15 milligrams per kilogram in the serum. And it has a great predictable dose response curve, right, with a very wide therapeutic window. So I'm plotting sedative effect over dose here. The purple line is phenobarb where those sedative effects don't really take hold until you're up to about 50 milligrams per kilogram. Typical doses, again, for alcohol use disorder are down here, 10 to 20. Contrast with benzodiazepines, where you get nearly immediate sedative effect, with, even with those early doses, and you never really know how steep this curve is going to be. And if you put a same graph here of CSF low over time for phenobarbitols, uh, excuse me, for lorazepam, you see a very complicated course here. Those initial doses need to be stacked to get to your therapeutic level. And then because of that short half-life, you get this seesawing effect. So you're closely monitoring, requiring frequent redosing, sometimes even in the ICU. And I think we've all seen those variable dose responses, patient to patient, and those paradoxical reactions where you're triggering agitation and delirium in these patients. So for all these reasons, I think the bottom line here is that phenobarbital appears to be at least safe and effective alternative to, phen to benzodiazepines for alcohol withdrawal. And the pharmacology really is what has this drawn to our attention. Now, some limitations. Prospective evidence is utterly lacking in this group, right? And there's also no agreed upon dosing protocol. And it, certainly true for our hospital, there seems to be less experience, both among doctors and nurses, and is often used improperly. And so that's something to be keeping in mind as this is seen. And I think you guys have probably seen, we have this new pilot that has been rolled out and likely to be rolled out more broadly. So I think you guys are gonna be seeing more phenobarbital um, for this reason and others. So returning to our question stem, I think we are at least adding phenobarbital as the options for treating alcohol withdrawal in the hospital. Okay, last topic. So returning to our same case here, we got the 48 year old. We've now stabilized things with LR, tolerating a normal diet. CWA scores are low after receiving a loading dose of phenobarbital in the LED, and we're estimating discharge in uh, 24 to 48 hours. Question for us. Um, which of the following is the best strategy to achieve sustained remission? Is that a chlordiazepoxide taper? Um, are we considering now trexone or acamprosate and refer to outpatient therapy? Maybe consider disulfram and refer to outpatient therapy or maybe just outpatient therapy alone. Okay, uh, just quickly here. I love this graph, right? We have this, oh, sorry, this picture. We have the sink overflowing. Uh, we've got a couple hospitalists here cleaning up the mess. I often feel like this where I wish you could just turn around and turn off that spigot. But unfortunately, so often we're stuck with our mops and brooms, right? So the background, you guys know this, 140,000 deaths annually from alcohol-related disease. This is more than the opioid epidemic. And we've seen these kind of numbers year after year as far back as we can calculate them. And for some reason, it seems to get less attention now, but this isn't an epidemic, this is a scourge, right? This has been going on and will continue to go on. <clears throat> and we have medicines for this, right? We know that medication-assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder reduces the risk of return to heavy drinking. And we don't have the same huge trials that we have for methadone and suboxone, for example. 
but I think as a surrogate outcome, return to heavy drinking is a reasonable target for us. And these are the list of medicines that are often considered as we think about medication assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder. And I'll limit our discussion really to these two. Disulfiram has largely fallen out of favor. Just a quick review of the evidence here. This is a systematic review published last year. This is their forest plot where to the left of the line favors a camper state, to the right favors placebo. And you can see a, a risk reduction down to 0.88 with a number needed to treat of 12, right? I don't know about you guys, but I can get to 12 patients pretty fast, right? And the same kind of numbers you're going to see for naltrexone, the name, number needed to treat of 18 with a similar looking tree in this study. You might be asking yourself, well, how do I choose them, right? In my mind, the evidence is about equivalent. It mostly has to do with patient factors as you're making this judgment. So I'll just point out a couple things, right? Liver failure and opioid use would be contraindicated in naltrexone. Naltrexone works by blocking those opioid receptors, so you really wouldn't want to be using them. The upside is that it's daily dosing and it's safe with renal disease, of course, which is a problem with renal failure. And downsides are it does block those opiates and it does have a slightly higher rate of headaches. A campersate can't be used in renal failure, although it is safe with renal disease and doesn't have any impact on opioid use. The real downside is the TID dosing. This can be a real challenge for folks. And so you have to have that conversation as you're making this treatment decision. You also have to have this conversation, right? Um, most of the folks I meet with this kind of issue, GI upset is going to be an unwelcome development. And so again, some cost benefit has to be considered here. Now, the work I want to tell you about is this uh, letter that was published in Annals last year. And here's an accompanying editorial. The title is Treatment of Alcohol Use Disorder in Hospitalized Patients, Some Sobering Findings. And so this was an observational cohort study. They basically looked at 28,000 Medicare beneficiaries hospitalized in 2016 with a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. And they asked the question, what was the rate of MAT uh, for this patient's population up to 30 days after discharge? And this is their data slide. Looking over on the left here, this is any MAT. The white bars are up to 30 days after discharge. And for those of you who can't see the y-axis, that's 2% at the top of that graph, right? 2%. So bottom line here, we are seeing a glaring care gap, right? Barely over 1% of patients filled a prescription for any MAT within 30 days, right? Now, I would just call your attention that hospitalization is an opportunity for behavioral change. And so we are seeing the vast majority of folks coming through our clutches without attacking this major, major issue. Now, we have some caveats, right? Questionable generalizability in terms of a Medicare population. You looked at the subgroups in this, pay <clears throat> this, this study, seem to have higher prescription rates among younger people, right? Slightly underaccounted in this population, but nonetheless, um, I think this is reasonably good data to base on. Um, we ought to have some running room with medication assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder. Now, for any of you residents out there, I would point out this study. This was a QI initiative done by UCSF residents where they just trained up their cohort in MAT and they had a just check large protocol that was done at admission and a discharge by those resident teams. And their MAT prescription rates went from 0% up to 64% within 30 days. And they were also able to measure a reduction in 30-day readmissions, right? So we have running room here, and I would encourage you all to consider it. Summary, we had the MINT trial showing that that liberal transfusion strategy had a slightly lower rate of recurrent MI and death, mostly with type 1 events. We had the Cape Cod trial showing that steroids seemed to reduce 30-day mortality and did reduce the need for intubation and severe community acquired pneumonia. We had the Apprentice study. This was the cohort that I largely skipped, sorry about that, showing that LR seemed to be associated with lower rates of progression to severe disease and acute pancreatitis. We talked about phenobarbital as being a safe and alternative strategy to alcohol withdrawal treatments in the hospital with favorable pharmacology. And then we just talked about MAT for AUD. And I encourage you to take the opportunity. And with that, I'll hand things over to my colleague. That's great, Ben. Thank you. So uh, as Ben and I were sort of preparing, uh, the first step we did was just to look at uh, all the, really all the notable articles that had come out in uh, 2023. And uh, we've, as part of that review, we found three uh, major trials that came out that I think were direct, uh, directly applicable to, how, uh, to hospital medicine. And then uh, as many of you are, I'm sure, are aware, uh, the new guidelines came out this last year. Um, and uh, so I'm going to actually focus the rest of the talk on hospital related issues related to atrial fibrillation. Um, I will tell you that unlike Ben's com uh, you know, presentation there, uh, this may not give you uh, really easy uh, things to know what to do with. 
but it will give you sort of a, a state of the state in terms of possible um, medicine and AFib. Um, and I think one of the difficult things about talking about uh, AFib and hospital medicine is that you're really talking about a lot of different things and there's different studies. Uh, and I think one of the really important things to think about is who is my patient population? And when you're comparing studies to make sure that you're using uh, the right studies and the right patient population. So there's really five different places that we commonly encounter AFib in the hospital. There's a patient who comes in with AFib where that's the primary issue. And so usually they have uh, RVR or heart failure that gets them in the door. There's the patient who comes in with stroke where we've identified AFib uh, either at presentation or during the hospitalization on telemetry. There's a patient who comes in with stroke, but there's no identified AFib, the so-called embolic stroke of undetermined source. Uh, there's AFib that happens incidentally. So the patient comes in with a pneumonia or with sepsis or with a, with a um, a surgery and AFib pops it set up in that context. And then there's so-called subclinical AFib, uh, which has become increasingly common, um, which is uh, with our increased uh, cardiac monitors, uh, what do we do with AFib that we find on there? And these are all actually very different uh, clinical situations. So I think it's important when we talk about the data to kind of separate those all out. First one I'd like to talk about is this one, uh, the stroke admission without identified atrial fibrillation. We'll start with a case, and you know, in case you're not familiar with ESAS, ESAS is essentially, uh, you know, the patient who comes in with a stroke that it's not multifocal. Uh, we don't think it's embolic from uh, a heart valve or from endocarditis. It's not a watershed stroke. This is our typical patient who comes in with uh, a unilateral, unilateral sort of one territory uh, stroke. So this is a six, seven-year-old man admitted with right-sided weakness. Expressive aphasia, uh, six hours presentation, uh, typical protoplasm here, essential hypertension, tobacco disease, uh, tobacco use, um, diabetes type 2, hyperlipidemia, standard uh, screening labs on admission, negative EKG in sinus and admission in an MRI with an acute uh, left MCA territory stroke. So our typical management, we give them an aspirin, we bump the Lipitor up, uh, they do cardiac or they do um, brain perfusion imaging. He's determined not to be a candidate. Uh, on the CTA, he has non-surgical carotid disease bilaterally. Um, we already spoke about the MRI echocardiogram. Uh, notably has some moderate left atrial enlargement, but otherwise unremarkable. He gets 48 hours of telemetry without arrhythmia. Manages blood pressure and his sugars, recommend uh, tobacco cessation, and we plan to discharge into a SNF. So extremely common uh, situation. So when you think about how do I prevent this patient's further risk of a stroke, do you start a DOAC uh, despite no identified uh, atrial fibrillation because of their high chads 2 vas score? Do you start a DOAC because of the high chads 2 vas score and left atrial enlargement, which is commonly uh, something that we think about and look at? Do we order a hypercognitive state panel because we don't have an etiology for the stroke? Do we discharge an aspirin and order a Zio patch uh, to ev evaluate for cold atrial fibrillation? Or do we not order an echo medical study? So I'm going to present this article, which is the uh, Stroke AF article. Uh, this uh, came out this year, um, but this is actually the second report from this large trial. The first trial came out in 2021, and I'm going to start by just reviewing the initial report in 2021. And so this is essentially these patients, uh, just as like I presented, the embolic stroke of unknown significance. And really, uh, the question is, we don't have any idea, uh, or we didn't have any idea, how frequent was it that we would find atrial fibrillation uh, following that? So this is a randomized clinical trial, 33 US-based uh, centers. And essentially, they put in cardiac monitors in, uh, in half of them. And then they did usual care in the other half, which is maybe I send you out on a Zio patch, Maybe your PCP does EKGs at follow-up appointments. We monitor for clinical symptoms, maybe an, do an EKG. So just standard care. And uh, their population, interestingly, this also included lacunar infarcts, which is uh, worth pausing on, but I'm not going to focus on. Um, and these had to be older patients. Uh, you know, these are sort of moderate CHADS2, uh, moderate to severe CHADS2 VAS scores. They had uh, a, a mean uh, score, excuse me, a medium score of five. And this is pre-pandemic here. So they enrolled uh, about 500 patients. Uh, very importantly, their goal was, uh, or their, their criteria for definition of AFib was greater than two minutes. 
And this is something that we're going to talk about in several different clinical situations. And especially when we're talking about that number, um, it's very important to think about uh, which patient population we're looking at. And, they, and so they look for so-called AFDAS, atrial fibrillation disturbed after stroke. Uh, in the, their goal in this study was really just to describe the rates of subsequent AFib uh, rather than to do a study where it looked at anticoagulation. Uh, and so this is the initial uh, pre um, uh, report in JAMA. And what they saw was that over the one year of that initial report, if you put in some sort of uh, implantable cardiac device, you found much more atrial fibrillation. Uh, versus control. So that top number there is the people who got to monitor. The bottom number is standard care. And also, if you look at that first month there, of the people who were ultimately determined to have atrial fibrillation, that Zyopats would have caught a very small percentage of those. Okay. So at, AFib, at one year, AFib defined as an episode of two, uh, two minutes was detected in 12.1% uh, with the monitor versus 1.8% of patients in the standard care group. Also importantly, the median time uh, to identification was three months. So that, that monitor is not going to catch most of that. And then there's some unclear clinical significance to what two minutes mean, although we'll return to this because I think in this patient population, two minutes means something, okay? Um, but uh, the median uh, time in people who had it determined was actually much longer than two minutes. Uh, it was you know, in the hour and a half range. And then just for some uh, prior background, uh, you know, people had looked at already in this context, well, if this is the case, why don't we put all of these people on anticoagulant, oral anticoagulants? And so this is the RESPECT, the RESPECT trial that came out. This was particularly in Davogatrin, but this trial was essentially repeated in all of the DOACs. And what they'd shown, uh, you know, this is unselected ESAS patients. They randomized them to aspirin or rivaroxaban and looked at stroke and med major bleeding. And all of the studies for all the DOACs essentially showed no uh, benefit of a DOAC over aspirin in an unstratified uh, ESAS uh, population. So this is their three-year reports, uh, and it's more of the same. Uh, the, I think the important uh, parts to this are that it continued to increase. Um, and so it depended on uh, what duration, but at one year, if you used a one-hour cutoff, uh, you were up to 20% 20, 20 of the ESAS patients who had uh, incident in atrial fibrillation. So that top is the uh, kind of blown up graph, by the way, the bottom number. If you look at the control there, you're, you're detecting a very small uh, percentage of patients. And then they actually broke it out into looking at uh, what is the duration there, because there is a concept of atrial fibrillation uh, um, burden. Uh, and it, it's one of the things that not necessarily in the ESAS population, and again, I want to call that out, but in other populations, it, uh, that plays a big role. But you can see that your chance of catching six minutes of AFib was much better than uh, your ch chance of catching uh, greater than uh, uh, one day of AFib. Uh, and at a cutoff again of one hour, uh, you had about 20% of patients at three years that had uh, incident AFib determined. So in this paper, uh, patient population of 500, they had about 64% who did the three-year follow-up. Cutoff at one hour was 20% versus 2% uh, in the um, implantable uh, cardiac or insertable cardiac monitors. And then the, when they looked at subgroups, they found that there's four factors that were associated with a significantly increased uh, group of, of subsequent uh, AFib detection. If you had a history of heart failure, if you had left atrial enlargement, as with our, uh, with our case, if you had a BMI greater than 30, or if you had a prolonged QRS greater than 120, your presentation, uh, or your, your chance of finding subsequent AFib was significantly increased. Incidentally, there was no stroke benefit uh, determined with finding more of this, but there, this wasn't really part of the study. And there were many people who had AFib that didn't get uh, anticoagulants because presumably their providers did, you know, made a judgment call that six minutes didn't meet their boundary. And there were many people who didn't have AFib uh, who were started on oral anticoagulants. So it kind of torpedoed the, uh, you know, the benefit of oral anticoagulation in this study, but uh, there wasn't any difference. So when I think about stroke uh, AFib study, the take homes, one would be we do a very bad job of identifying AFib following ESS with usual care. Although we're not entirely clear uh, what a short run of AFib means, um, but we're going to talk more about that in a second. 
uh, and the benefit of anticoagulation in very short runs of AFib is not fully established. Um, in patients with ESAS, uh, it appears to continue to rise up to about a max of 30% with a threshold of six minutes uh, and about 20% with a threshold of greater than one hour. And then, as I mentioned, your Xiopatch is really only going to catch a very small uh, part of those uh, population. The other important things I think, asymptomatic AFib was very common. So in the patient uh, population who had the monitors, uh, their subsequently identified AFib was, 88, uh, was asymptomatic in 88%. So a strategy of outpatient follow-up with EKG for, uh, for symptoms is probably not effective. And then as I mentioned, you have this uh, higher subgroup population in those four categories. So if we go back to our case, uh, the option of starting a DOAC just due to high chest vas score, we know the answer to that, and the answer is no. Uh, the option of a uh, hypercoagulable state panel or echo or bubble study because of the pre existing high CHAS2 VAS score, the age, et cetera, that's generally not uh, uh, recommended. Um, so, I guess my answer would be to order a 30 day Xio patch, but recognize that I'm going to catch a very small percentage of the people incidentally. Also, kind of left with this second one. If we find that, you know, there's a much higher incidence of subsequent AFib with patients with left atrial enlargement, maybe that's a population that will benefit. Um, and this is what I'm talking about here. So, can we use certain clinical characteristics to identify higher pop, uh, higher risk population for subsequent AFib uh, in the ESAS population? And therefore, if we found those clinical characteristics, we would anticoagulate those patients. And so this is the Arcadia trial. This actually uh, was formally published uh, just a week ago, two weeks ago, um, but it came out in EPUB uh, in 2023, so I considered it fair game. Uh, it's a randomized double-blind clinical trial, one of our best uh, studies. Um, this was uh, Canadian and, and NIH uh, US-based uh, stroke centers, uh, age greater than 45, CHADS2 VAS score, moderate risk, 4.7. And they had to have ESS with some evidence of an atrial cardiomyopathy. So they had to have an interminal BNP greater than 250, enlarged left to atrium or uh, EKG findings. Uh, don't ask me what that means, but some sort of EKG finding that it, uh, identified higher risk. And they essentially randomized these patients to aspirin versus the DOAC. This is uh, from actually the, the guidelines. And, you know, conceptually, when we think about AFib, we can think about uh, you know, there is some sort of underlying protoplasm that makes people more um, more prone to AFib, and then there's some sort of trigger on top of that, be that infection, MI, surgery, sepsis, what have you. So the Arcadia trial, unfortunately, uh, has come out and there was zero benefit uh, to anticoagulating this population, uh, despite all really good data. Uh, and it was actually stopped early for futility Notables in there, the intracerebral hemorrhage risk uh, was actually lower for DOAC versus aspirin. So this, the ESS population is going to get an aspirin no matter what. So in this situation, you can feel a little bit better about, you know, oh my goodness, am I going to create more intracranial hemorrhage? The answer is no. The bleeding risk was the same as aspirin. And then even kind of more damning, when they did uh, a subgroup analysis to look at, okay, in the highest group, which has two vast score, did we benefit those people? The answer was no. So I think we can go back to our case and actually take B out based on the Arcadia trial. And it leaves us with the very unsatisfying 30 day Zio patch. That's the status of where we are. Sorry, that's not terrible. So in the ESAS, AFib, extremely common after ESAS. We identify it much more commonly if we use some sort of implantable cardiac monitor. It's not entirely clear what duration of AFib compares a significant increased risk, and thus it's unclear if all patients with any AFib, uh, this, we're moving away from all of our Coumadin studies, uh, which were really in just clinical AFib, now that we have all these monitors and things. Um, although I would, uh, I'm gonna make some comments about that later. And then in a strategy of trying to identify patients who are high risk based solely on their clinical features, doesn't work. And that's regardless of uh, their chad to ask score. So now I'm going to move on to, so we're putting ESAS away. We're going to move over to so-called subclinical uh, AFib. And this is uh, AFib without any symptoms that's found typically uh, on a device interrogation. So uh, keep in mind, again, we're moving to, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a person who came in with a stroke, you automatically have a two on your chad to ask score. 
This person may not at all, okay? So a 65 year old woman with history of coronary disease and cabbage uh, and a previous uh, VFib arrest with an AICD. She comes in with generalized fatigue and a kidney injury. Uh, uh, she uh, has an EF of 40% documented, no valvular disease. She's on appropriate goal directed medical therapy. Importantly, no history of cerebral vascular disease. Uh, we talked about her meds. Uh, she clinically looks volume depleted. She's on a diuretic. Her lungs are clear. She has no peripheral edema. Emission EKG is normal sinus. She gets a telemetry with no arrhythmia. She rules out. Uh, echo looks fine. So she gets rehydrated. Her renal function normalizes. She's feeling better. She's ready to go but you interrogated her pacer because uh, you were worried about that. And you find that there's no shocks, but she now has documented 15 runs of AFib, lasting a maximum of 15 minutes since the last download. Okay, I've identified AFib. I'm gonna start her on a DOAC. I'm gonna order a TEE in her to identify, to, you know, try to find a thrombus and I'll start a DOAC if I find that. I'm going to check a CT pulmonary angiogram. I'm going to add Plavix. Or I'm going to consult cardiology. So this is actually going to be increasingly common. And as we get better uh, iPhones, this is going to be even more increasingly common. Okay. So this is data actually from uh, from cardiac devices. This was uh, released in circulation 2019. I think this is very applicable to our population. Uh, and what they saw in this is uh, in cardiac devices, there was an interaction between duration of AFib and CHADS2 VASC score and risk of subsequent events. So if you had a CHADS2 VASC of one, uh, your risk was below that magic 1%, uh, even with greater than a day of, of AFib. If your CHAS2 VAS score was four, it mattered between whether you had less than a day or more than a day. And if you were greater than five, it, uh, it was more than a day. Uh, it, it was sort of applicable across. Now, I think it's important to point that out because the thing we just talked about is ESOS. And so those patients have a two already, okay? So that six minutes that we were just talking about in an ESOS patient is in the, we need to anticoagulate kind of uh, category, okay? So, uh, and the reason I point that out is there's lots of data that shows that in identified AFib following ESUS, oftentimes people don't get anticoagulation. And that's actually a big uh, gap issue in terms of our care. It also disproportionately affects minority populations, things that we should be working on, okay? So it's important again to remember which population. This is subclinical AFib, people who don't have a history of uh, stroke. So this is the Artesia trial that came out specifically to look at this. Uh, and essentially, um, this is a double-blinded randomized trial. This is one of two that came out. Uh, 4,000 patients with some sort of cardiac device, a pacemaker, AICD, or just an intracardiac monitor. O uh, older patients, uh, mean chads 2 vest score of four. And they put half of them into uh, DOAC and half of them into AFib, I'm sorry, into aspirin. Uh, and that was for a six minute to, to, uh, to one day. And if you think about that, that makes total sense. They picked that four there. And so they're saying six minutes to one day, I'm gonna anticoagulate those patients and see what happens, okay? Their implants were stroke and bleeding. Uh, this again was EPUB uh, last year, but came out uh, formally this year. And what they saw was that this strategy actually worked in this population. Now, it's again, I'm going to say it again, but it's really important to think about your population. Who has device monitors? These are older patients in general with cardiac disease. So is this applicable necessarily to a younger patient without cardiac disease? Probably not. But they did see benefit, and, and it's pretty clear. Now, that top one is blown up a lot. That's 10% up at the top. The bottom one there, the absolute number is not all that crazy. Um, so that when you break, down, break it all down, uh, the uh, stroke risk for uh, AFib uh, was 0.78 with a do, uh, DOAC versus 1.24 percent. Gives you a number needed to treat of 217 for stroke prevention. Bleeding risk, uh, 1.71 versus 0.9. Number needed to harm for 129. Absolute numbers very low in this situation. Uh, they also did a meta-analysis and a differently published study of uh, the NOAA study in the Artesia, and there was no change in all-cause mortality. 
So one might ask the question, how generalizable is this? Well, it's, you know, you're in square ground if this is a cardiac device. Um, but does this mean anything for ESOS patients? Does it mean anything for any other patients? Not necessarily. This is a high risk population that have a reason to have a device for some reason. The answer I'd say is cancer cardiology in this situation. Okay, punt. They need to come and have a discussion uh, about this. Uh, the numbers are real small again. So if you have to treat a thousand patients to prevent uh, four strokes. You're going to buy eight uh, eight bleeds. I think uh, importantly, uh, the intracranial hemorrhage. And you know, there's this constant debate about well, do I really care about a major bleed if it doesn't kill them versus a stroke uh, makes them hemiparetic? Um, so I think importantly in here, uh, intracranial hemorrhage was a uh, very similar to aspirin. Um, and there's been several recent meta-analysis that came out that really suggest that uh, DOACs are no worse than aspirin. If you're using a comparator of aspirin versus no therapy, uh, you can feel better that you're not probably uh, creating intracranial hemorrhage or not. Okay, so for the remainder of this, I'm going to focus on the things that uh, I see we see all see commonly, uh, which is AFib, uh, so-called precipitated AFib, or in the new uh, new uh, guideline, they, they describe this as um, acute AFib. So this is AFib that you find while somebody's admitted for sepsis or pneumonia or, or what have you. Certainly a very common thing that we see. So a 70-year-old uh, gentleman who's admitted to the uh, unit with sepsis related to cholecystitis. He needs pressors, he gets a biliary drain, antibiotics, et cetera, stabilizes. He's noted in the unit to have a run of AFib that lasts several hours, but with stabilization, he converts back to normal sinus and then he gets transferred to the floor uh, on my service for care. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, what do I do with this? AFib is AFib, put him on a go out. Uh, let's put in an implantable cardiac monitor and sort this out. Uh, let's check an echo and, uh, you know, if he has signs on the echo, let's start him on a DOAC. Let's check a TADS2 VAS score and anticoagulate if he's greater than two or traditional cutoff or if he's very high risk. Or send out on a 30 days IO patch. So, so this is actually data. So the, the rest of my talk is coming from the guidelines. Um, this is uh, some of the data that we have that helps us in this situation. This is from JAMA Cardiology back in 2016. Uh, and this is administrative data, uh, so uh, keep that in mind. But one of the interesting things from this, they looked at just all the patients who had a coexisting diagnosis of AFib and sepsis, and they looked at practice patterns across the United States. And so this is actually a plot of all of the hospitals or many of the hospitals across the United States. And what you see is nobody knows what to do, so there's a huge variation. Some people were anticoagulating everybody who got AFib uh, in concept, and some people were anticoagulating none of them. There was, uh, you know, some small differences depending on which service you were on, and notably the vast majority of these patients were on just the medicine service, which is, uh, I think, yeah, what, what is, um, you know, what I see. So the results of this, again, this, this uh, administrative data was that there was, uh, if you did not do propensity-based uh, you know, matching or anything, unadjusted scores, there was no benefit. Uh, you see that, uh, that confidence interval there for ischemic stroke clearly across one, and there was a clear signal for harm uh, bleeding uh, in that patient, the septic patient. Uh, and even if they did propensity score matching, those things uh, remained, uh, you, you still had a non-significant uh, change in ischemic stroke and an increased risk of bleeding. And their conclusion was that the, and, and they also did subgroup analysis and the chads 2 vast score didn't even help you in this situation. So you couldn't even say, well, these patients who were high risk, they were the ones that were gonna benefit. And again, you saw increased clinically uh, significant bleeding during the hospitalization if you did that. So I think the answer is we don't really know. Uh, but probably anticoagulation, anticoagulating those patients in the unit is a bad idea. Um, when they get to the floor, hmm, I don't know. And the last one I want to talk about is infectious, complicating sort of lesser degrees of stress. And uh, this is uh, uh, also an older study, 2018. This is a, a retrospective study of administrative data. This was one hospital in Quebec, uh, and they looked at uh, lesser degrees of stress. So the uh, acute pulmonary disease, which was just an ammonia, kind of a floor patient, COPD exacerbation, and PE, uh, of 
you know, jump to the chase and essentially the same findings here. OK, no clear benefit of anticoagulation. And this was actually out to three years um, post. Uh, so again, keeping in mind the limitations of this, uh, our study de uh, demonstrates that the benefit of anticoagulation secondary AFib, what we now call acute AFib, is not strong and can be associated with a higher risk of bleeding, careful assessment. So this is from the guidelines here. If you uh, look at that right graph, this just kind of bringing home that the less, stre uh, less stressful event um, uh, probably means that you're closer to that. Uh, they're going to more likely recur versus if you only see it in cardiac surgery, it, it may be less likely to recur. This is their uh, somewhat helpful and somewhat not helpful. Uh, acute precipitation there, anticoagulation after ass uh, assessing risks and benefits. Mm, how do I do that? Uh, counseling regarding risk of a recurrent AFib. Okay, you may have AFib. Uh, arrange outpatient follow-up, aka punt, uh, and then in follow-up in the clinic there, assess need for continued rate of rhythm control and risk stratification for continued anticoagulation. Uh, so really no help, okay? Uh, so this is their uh, guideline statement. Patients who are AFib, uh, AFib in the setting of acute medical illness should be counseled about the significant risk, okay? Outpatient follow-up uh, for uh, oral anticoagulation initiation or continuation, so you could start it there or not, uh, is, is recommended. And then probably in the case of sepsis with AFib, you are hurting the patient by anticoagulating in the case of uh, acute sepsis. So, so in and uh, transient AFib and acute medical illness, recurrence seems to be inversely related to the severity of the stressor. So no precipitant, that's kind of AFib. Uh, cardiac surgery, not AFib. Um, if sepsis studies suggest a lack of anticoagulation, what do I do with the patient who gets it with a low-grade pneumonia or a COPD? Is that more likely to recur as an outpatient? And thus, I should feel more, you know, more prone to anticoagulate them. Studies in ESAS at least suggest that that xylopatch is not going to help you. So what is the duration of AFib? And again, this is AFib not in the context of ESAS. That increases the risk enough to swing the balance in favor of anticoagulation. And so I think, you know, in these patients, we're left with a very unsatisfying CHADS2 VASC score, you know, burden of disease. The other thing that's in the current guidelines is that um, there are things, it's becoming clear that CHADS2 VASC score is not a perfect score. There are things that are in, uh, that are consistently coming out as increased risk of subsequent stroke that are not in CHADS2 VASC score. And I wanted to call those out. So. Uh, kidney disease, poorly controlled hypertension, obesity, uh, proteinuria, all those things are actually should increase in your mind a little bit, the chad vas score. The other thing they point out is that age is a much stronger risk factor. Um, so even though you get one for age and you get one for diabetes, that one for age is a much higher risk factor. So if age is one of your points, that increases the uh, odds. So, my summary, uh, stroke AF, AFib after ES, ESS is common, 30 days out path probably shouldn't make you feel any better. There's increased risk of certain subgroups, but the Arcadia trial says that's not super helpful. Artesia trial, this is in devices. Uh, there is a benefit to DOAC uh, if you identify really any, um, but it's really small and associated with more bleeding, uh, probably something to have the cardiologist talk to them. Transient AFib and sepsis, you don't know what to do but probably don't anticoagulate them during the sepsis. And medical illness, even less clear. Uh, we're probably left with uh, thinking about chest 2 vasc and those other features, thinking about burden of, uh, of AFib, how long it lasts. My references. Wow, I don't know how you did it. You brought us perfectly to nine o'clock. Um, thank you for just a wealth of information, um, practical and also super informative. I feel less alone in the wild world of hospital AFib. So thank you both.